importance of our call by the licentiate John Coulter. Session would like to thank all who came along to support the call on, on Thursday evening, and especially to Martha and Matthew for the excellent delivery and content of the speeches on the evening. Uh, could I say just also on a personal note that I very much appreciate those who have encouraged and, and complimented me for that evening. Uh, all who attended have commented on the blessing and the atmosphere of the evening. God has done great things for this congregation over the past year. And there is the promise of even greater to come. As we look forward to welcoming John and Deborah and little Daniel, who incidentally uh, made it along on Thursday night as well. The good news is that for those who couldn't make it along, uh, is that the evening's events are re recorded and you can view them on the YouTube website uh, for Trinity RPC. Um, I would recommend that you do try to see the, the acceptance speech by John, at least, for this is a, a historic moment in our congregation. Join in the blessing and expect a lot more as we prepare for an exciting new chapter ahead. And continue as well to, to thank God daily for his provision for Drumbolg. So uh, with that in mind, midweek, 8 p.m. on Wednesday night, please come uh, if you can. Next Sabbath morning, or next Sabbath, there are two services. We're not sure yet who the preacher will be in the morning, but the evening service will be taken by the Reverend Philip Moffat. And as he prepares us for the event uh, ahead. So, uh, finally, could the members of session and committee stay behind after the service for a, a very brief meeting on a matter requiring urgent attention? And we'll, we'll meet at the back of the church there as, as we usually do. So, that's session and committee. At the end of the service, there's a wee decision to be made. So uh, please remember that. So with that, I hand over to Malcolm for today's service. Thank you, Leslie. As he said, I have been here once before to preach. And so if anyone can come at the end of the service and tell me what I preached on, I have a special prize. I think it was either 84 or 85 at an evening service. And so you're all sufficiently aged to remember back as far as that. I have looked through my notes and all I know that Isaac Cole was here and we were back with him afterwards. But uh, apart from that, the only other occasion I have been here as far as I remember is Synod was held here in 2003, and I was here on a, the Monday evening, the first evening of that presbytery, and then I had other activities uh, later on in that week. And so it's always nice coming back to places that I don't really know, and uh, getting to know people. And so I trust that we'll be very conscious of God's presence to lead us and to guide us and to be with us today. Now let us begin our service as we sing words of praise and we use the words of Psalm 119. We use the part 17a and sing this whole, uh, the whole uh, four stanzas of this section to the tune Hesperus number 14. We come here, the Lord's day. Not to listen to a man's voice, but to listen to God's voice. And he speaks to us through his word. And so we know that your statutes, Lord, are wonderful, 
and so my soul will, le- will them obey. The entrance of your words gives light to teach the simple wisdom's way. I opened wide my mouth to pant for your commands. I long to hear. Is that true for us? Are we longing, panting, desiring to know what God would say to us? In grace, turn to me, so you deal with those who do your name hold dear. So these four stanzas of Psalm 119, 17a, the tune number 14, Hesperus, let us worship God. Our Father, how indeed we thank you that we're here to meet with you and that you have promised to meet with those who gather together to worship. Where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are. And so, our Father, we pray that each one of us here today might indeed be really conscious of your presence, really conscious of your voice, And as we read your word, as we meditate that word, may that word speak to our hearts with a freshness, with a power, rebuking us, encouraging us, and helping us. Father, we know as we come together, we have to confess how sinful we are. We're in the presence of a holy God. And Father, more and more as time passes, As your spirit deals with us, we become more and more conscious how deep that sin is in our hearts and lives. But how we thank you for the Lord Jesus who died on the cross, that you might be able to pardon and forgive all of our sins, every single sin. And we thank you that because of that work of Jesus, you see us as being as holy, as upright, as sinless, as he is and was. And so, Father, may we indeed rejoice today in Jesus. Rejoice in him as our Savior, as our Lord, as our King, the one who is our example, the one who is our friend, who is our our brother. And may we delight to have fellowship with him. And Father, as we spend time in his presence, 
We pray that something of his fragrance might be found upon us. And as we are found in the presence of other people, may they detect that fragrance of Christ about us. And so, Father, we pray that this our time of morning worship, may it be a blessing to our soul, a help for the remainder of this day and of this week, that you would go before us and lead us and guide us and bless us. And Father, what we ask for ourselves here in this place, we ask for other meeting places in this neighborhood, in this whole island, indeed throughout the world today, wherever your word is read, wherever the Lord Jesus is being faithfully presented, we pray that you would take your word and make it a blessing to many. Draw many to yourself. May this be a day of great, great rejoicing as many find the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior for the first time and as others are built up in their faith and your kingdom extended. And so, Father, be with us and bless us together and pardon of our many sins, for we ask it in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us read together from God's Word. We're going to read from a number of passages. First of all, from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And here God is meeting with Moses at the burning bush. We begin our reading at verse 9. Exodus 3 and verse 9. God speaking here to Moses. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And then the beginning of chapter 4. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, Put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it out on the dry ground. And the water that you, that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, O my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is it not Aaron your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, 
And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. Then turning to the New Testament, Epistle of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 2, well-known passage. And we'll read together the first 11 verses from this passage. Philippians chapter 2, and reading from verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or, or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, as a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. <clears throat> this is God's holy, precious, and infallible word. Now I see a few children here and I want to speak just for a moment to them and I have a very, very simple question to ask them. If you add together one and one and one, what is the answer? Yes? Three. Three. Well done. Is that always true, that every time you add one and one and one together, you get three? Because I think sometimes it's different. One and one and one make one. Can anyone tell me when that is true? Sorry? Oh, that is true as well. When you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they make one God. It isn't that the Father is a third of God, and the Son is a third, and the Holy Spirit a third, but each of them are 100% God. But together, they make one God. And so I don't want you going to school and saying to the teacher, when she starts, or he starts doing maths, that they're wrong, that one and one and one always make one. But perhaps you can say in your class, sometimes one and one and one make one when it's talking about God. We cannot understand that fully. But we believe it because God has taught us that in his word. Jesus was fully God when he came to earth. The Holy Spirit is fully God. And yet it is the Father who sent Jesus into the world. It's the Father and Jesus who sent the Holy Spirit into the world. 
And yet, together, one God. There are many, many books written trying to explain this. And yet the truth is, when we find ourselves in heaven, if we love Jesus, even there, we will not be able to understand it fully. But we will see it with our own eyes. How each of the three persons of the Godhead together make one God. We do not worship three gods. There is only one God. But that God is made up of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think that's a one. And we should give thanks for it. And we should pray that God would help us to understand it more and more. Now we're going to sing from a psalm which speaks about that greatness of God. It's Psalm 145. Psalm 145, and it's the A version of this psalm, and we're going to sing the first six stanzas of this psalm. You I'll exalt my God, O King, and I will bless your name always. I'll bless you every single day. Your name forever I will praise. Great is the Lord, much to be praised. His greatness fully search can none. Even the person who is the most, that who is the top of the class cannot understand these things. Even the most brilliant people in our world cannot understand fully these things. They're beyond us, but they're true. This is God. God who is great. God who is good. And in the sixth stanza, the Lord so very gracious is and merciful as he also, also in loving kindness he is great and unto anger he is slow. And so the psalmist here is telling us these many, many wonderful truths about God. We give thanks for all of these things and yet we will never fully understand them. Because he is God, and we are simply creatures. So Psalm 145a, the tune is, In Christ Alone, let us sing the first six stanzas together.
Let us again join together in prayer. Yes, Father, although you are, humanly speaking, with human intelligence, impossible to be known, yet we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in creation, in your word, and especially in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that each one of us here would have a real desire to know you more and more, especially the children, that you would help them to learn about you, about your goodness, your faithfulness, your grace. And Father, we do thank you for your grace and love, especially to this congregation in these past few days, in providing a pastor. And Father, we pray for all of the arrangements needing to be made in the coming days and weeks, and pray that that will be a happy and blessed relationship for many years, and that you would be pleased to use John's ministry for the building up of this congregation, for the reaching of many in the community, and for being a real strength and blessing to many, many people. And yet, Father, as we give thanks, we are conscious that there is still great need in our wider church that are vacancies. We thank you for the men who are studying at the college at the moment, but we pray that your spirit would raise up others who would hear your call to Christian service, especially to preach the word. And yes, Father, we pray that in every one of our congregations, may you be at work to raise up spiritual leaders, to call elders where elders are needed. But Father, we thank you for all of your many, many blessings to us. We thank you for these years of blessing that we have a land have known, years of peace. And yet, Father, as we listen to the news, read newspapers day by day, we are very conscious that there is the possibility of war. And so, Father, we pray today for the whole situation in Ukraine. We ask for those who are true believers there in that land. And we thank you that there are many, many Christians there. And we pray that even today, may they know that you are indeed their refuge, their strength, their help. And Father, we pray that whatever the region of that land, we pray that you would be at work. You are sovereign in all affairs. And so, Father, we pray that you would use all of these circumstances to cause men to turn to you to pray, to pray for Ukraine, to pray for Russia, to pray for Belarus, to pray for Poland, all these other lands. We think too of Afghanistan, the great, great material need, but also the spiritual poverty there. And yet, Father, again, we thank you that there are those who are our brethren in Christ who live there, who seek to serve you there. And Father, we pray that despite persecution, despite difficulties, that you would encourage them and that they would see others coming from spiritual darkness into spiritual light as they accept your word, as they accept your teaching about your son and your teaching about our sinful needs. Yes, Father, bless your servants in that land. Not simply those lands, but all lands where those who your people are being persecuted. Father, look upon these places, we pray, with great mercy, with great loving kindness, and bless your people. Yet, yes, you are sovereign. And so we pray that your will might be done. 
and that all of these situations might enable people more and more to see that one day they will have to stand before you, a holy, sovereign God, and how they need to be right with you. And so, Father, we pray today, whatever the land, whatever the language, as your word goes forth, may you be calling many, many to yourself. So, Father, what we pray for these many lands, we pray again, especially for this land, for this neighborhood, for friends, for family, for loved ones. We pray for those who are far from you, who are strangers to your grace. Father, be at work in their lives, we pray, that your name might be honored and glorified. And we ask all of these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to ask each of you here this morning a very simple question. What is the dominant sin in your life? What is the dominant sin in your life? Now, I have to say that I didn't say to Philip Muffet, you know, Philip, tell me uh, what is the biggest need in this congregation? I didn't phone Norris and say, Norris, all your years here, you would know what's the problem, what's the ongoing sin, what can I speak to here this morning? No, I haven't been speaking to anyone about all of these things. But simply from observing life, from knowing my own heart, from my reading of Scripture, I want to suggest that there is one sin that is found all over the world and is often the dominant sin in many of our lives. And that sin is pride. And maybe that surprises you. Because pride is something we can see more easily in others than we can see in ourselves. No parent has to teach their children to be proud. But after a few years... A child will say, I, I'm better than so-and-so. I was able to do this. And all through life, they will say how good they are at different things. Pride manifests itself in many different ways. And pride gives birth to other sins and often obstructs godly habits. And so this morning I want us to turn to one of the Psalms that speaks about the sin of pride. It's a very, very long Psalm because it's got 66 words in it. I wonder, can you guess what Psalm has only got 66 words? It's Psalm 131. A little Psalm of three verses. And I want to read these three verses together. A song of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quietened my soul like a winged child with its mother. Like a winged child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And friends, if we're honest, we have to admit that humility is one of the things that we need more and more today. And concerning this, Sam C.H. Spurgeon describes it as an un, in, an, in an unforgettable way. He writes, to read it, it is one of the shortest, but to learn, it is one of the longest. It speaks of a child, but evokes the experiences of a man mature in Christ. 
If one considers all the Psalms as precious stones, this one is a real peril. And elsewhere he says, this Psalm is a short ladder, but it rises to a great height. And friends, humility is one of the most difficult subjects to tackle because I'm not here today to say I am an example of humility. Many of us think that humility is a sign of weakness, whereas in fact it's an evidence of spiritual strength. Many, many years ago I saw a, a Peanuts cartoon And in it, Linus tells Charlie Brown, I'm twice as humble as you. And as someone has said, once you think you are humble, you've lost it. Nevertheless, in these verses of Psalm 131, David seems to be suggesting that he has gained and acquired a certain humility. And perhaps that surprises us. The faults and sins of David are so obvious as we read those books in the Old Testament. How could he write these verses? Indeed, one of the very first appearances of David on the pages of Scripture, his father had sent him with food to go to his brothers who were part of Saul's army. And Goliath was challenging the troops of Israel. And David said he was willing to fight. And one of David's brothers said to him, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. It was only to see the battle that you came. Was David's big brother a liar? Or did he really know David as being a conceited, proud young man? In the same way, we can imagine that someone who was a king, someone who was an accomplished musician and writer, would be very proud of his achievements. And so we need to look at all of these things and many other things that arise in these few verses. So let us see, first of all, the problem. The problem. In the very first verse, David says, O Lord, My heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. And we might imagine that David was saying that he has always been like that. And yet in the second verse, there's the image of a weaned child in the words, I have calmed and quietened my soul. And there we see that David is saying that there had been progress in his life. What he's able to write in this psalm hadn't always been true. And perhaps his older brother was right when he said that David was conceited back there in his teenage years. We don't know what age he was when he wrote these verses. But there is the admission that these words weren't always true for him. And I want to suggest to each one of us here today, wherever we are, no matter how many years we've been walking with the Lord Jesus, many years we have claimed to be believers, yes, we can look back and we can say there are moments, moments, perhaps there's been an evidence of some humility. But other moments, alas, much, much evidence of pride. If I were to ask you today, what was the first sin? You'd be able to say it was when they took the forbidden fruit. But I want to suggest that that was an act. And before that act, there were thoughts. Why is God preventing us doing these things? And so that visible act was only the outward act of a rebellion, of a pride that was growing there in the heart. And ever since those events in the Garden of Eden, every person 
who's entered this world, every descendant of Adam and Eve, has been born a sinner. And pride and everything linked to it have been part of our sinful nature. And I could spend the whole morning describing how pride manifests itself. But I want simply to give a number of biblical verses which underline how dangerous pride is. Psalm 31 verse 23. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. In Proverbs 6 verse 16, there's a list that begins, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, the first one. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5, from verse 5. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And so time and time again, all through God's word, from Old Testament to New Testament, from beginning to end, exhortation after exhortation, to clothe ourselves in humility, to put off this pride that is so present in our hearts. Someone has said that pride is like an onion. One layer. But there's another layer underneath. It's always there. It's very destructive of all kinds of relationships. We may be able to cover up all kinds of other sins. But this is one of the hardest to hide. Sooner or later, it manifests itself. Many marriages have been broken because someone refused to say sorry. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. Many churches are in difficulty because many people, they say, my will may it be done. May people do what I want to be done. And indeed, all kinds of self-worship are practiced today throughout the world, whether it be world of sports, politics, entertainment. We watch television and, and people are saying, look at me, how great I am, how wonderful I am. Put your trust in me. Very few are saying, yes, I'm needy. I'm often wrong. I need your help. And even in some Christian circles, there are televangelists, particularly in the States, and their gospel is, come to me and be as rich as I am, be as celebrated as I am. Pride. Pride. But often each one of us, when we're confronted with particular situations, with particular problems, how do we react? What will people say about me? What will happen to me? We put ourselves at the very center of this situation. We never think of others. What will happen to them? What is the greatest need? A little sentence in Luke's gospel tells us that this sin was even prevalent among the disciples of Jesus. Now an argument started among the disciples as to which of them was the greatest. Yes, the problem of pride. It's found in all of our hearts. But secondly, let us think of the model. One of the early church fathers, a man called Augustine, 
said that the three most important virtues in the Christian life are humility, humility, and humility. And however we try to consider humility as a quality in itself and not simply as an absence of pride, we often struggle. What does humility look like? And again, many, many biblical verses underline its importance. Psalm 25, verse 9, He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Proverbs 3.34, God mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 16.19, better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Isaiah uh, 57.15, God lives in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And sometimes it's easier to see humility illustrated in the lives of men. And so we turn to think of different men in scripture. And if we start with David himself, we see that David was never a candidate for anything. Although he had been anointed by Samuel to be king, he did nothing to become king. Saul hunted him and pursued him. Although David had many opportunities, he could have speeded up the moment when he would have been king. But no, he didn't. And after he became king of Israel, or of Judah, he had to wait for the other tribes to accept him. He did nothing to speed it up. He wanted to build a temple, but God said no. In a sense, we might say all through his life, David saw himself simply as a shepherd. All that had happened to him was simply because of the grace of God to him. David was never saying, I am the greatest. I am the best. I am top. But no. The grace of God has been such to me that I have been able to occupy these different situations and positions. We could consider Moses at great length. In Numbers 12, verse 3, we read in the NIV particularly, Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else, on the face of the earth. And yet that wasn't always the case. We read there those passages in Exodus 3 and 4. And there was God speaking to Moses at the burning bush. And they might say, well, this is Moses being really humble. I am not very good at speaking. I am not very good at these things. Humility? No. God is never angry with those who are humble, but he's angry with disobedience. And so Moses wasn't able to appreciate God's presence, God's help, God's promises. He he was being disobedient. And yet, of course, no matter how profitable it might be to think of many, many people in God's word, The greatest model in all these things is Jesus himself. In Matthew 11, 29, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And of course, one of the reasons for his total lack of pride is that he was born without sin. The only one in the human race to be without sin. But for 2,000 years, we have this list of examples of his words, of his acts, as examples of how he acted in various situations. He never sought his own glory. He came not to be served, but to serve. He was ready to do most ungracious tasks 
like washing the disciples' feet. He didn't go around looking for the top people in life, but he was happy to spend time with those who were despised, rejected, those who were excluded from society. When he was reviled, he did not revile again. When he suffered, he did not threaten. There was silence, there was joyful submission when all kinds of injustices were happening to him. And so we read there from Philippians 2, and Paul's great challenge to us, this example of the Lord Jesus, his total, total humility. And Paul says, your attitude should be that of Christ Jesus. To be humble is to be like the Lord Jesus. Someone has said, humility always followed Jesus, just like a shadow. And there in the upper room, yes, he washed Peter's feet and John's feet. But he washed also Judas's feet. Even though he knew that in a few moments Judas would leave to go to betray him. Yet he washed his feet. Are we ready to do all kinds of things to those who may may know not to be loving toward us? Yes, at the end of that time in the upper room, washing feet, Jesus says, I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And yet sometimes as we think of these things, we may have legitimate questions. For example, in 1 Timothy 3, a passage which speaks about eldership and service, we read, If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. What is the difference between a legitimate aspiration and a proud ambition? And I think the answer lies in the life of Jesus himself. Jesus came to accomplish a glorious work, but always, 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 with a spirit of service. He did it for the good of others, but not for his own personal glory. And friends, if we are honest, we are all very, very far from that example. By nature, we think of ourselves as being quite good. By nature, we think we have many qualities. People often say how good we are. People say it's great you're able to do these things. And perhaps sometimes we think God must be very content with how we are because of this goodness, because of these acts, because of these qualities. And yet when we read God's word, we find that all of our qualities, real as they may be, our good works, real as they might be, none of these things are sufficient before God. The Bible says the opposite. All of these things that come from our own sinful hearts cannot fully please God. The first act of humility is recognizing our own personal sin, our own personal need of confessing to God our need of a Savior. That's the beginning of humility. The Psalm 131 follows Psalm 130. And there the psalmist says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, Who could stand? Yes, the sin in each of our lives is such. If we were relying upon our own selves, our own qualities, yes, none of us, none of us could have any peace with God, any assurance of being with him forever. But how we should be full of gratitude to the Lord Jesus 
and thankful for all that he did on the cross. The Apostle Paul called himself the least of all the apostles. Conscious of the depth and abundance of sin in his life. Yes, we may have many qualities. We may have done many things that are good and profitable, helpful for many other people. In Psalm 8, a psalm that we often turn to, we read that in the creation of God, man is crowned with glory and honor. Nevertheless, that psalm begins and ends with a sentence, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How majestic is your name. Not the name of any man, any woman. All through our lives here upon earth, our attitude should be that of John the Baptist. He must increase and I must decrease. The model. Then thirdly, let us think of the progress. In verse 2, the psalmist uses this image of a winged child to illustrate another aspect of spiritual growth. We might call it contentment. A baby during his or her first months is completely dependent on his parents, especially the mother, if the mother is breastfeeding, for example. And if we're able to speak to a little baby and say, what are mummies for? Mummies are only there for feeding me. That's all that mummies do. And when the the baby is hungry and tired, it balls his head off. Where is mummy? And yet, of course, after a few months, the child grows. The child becomes content and understands that, yes, mummy will come soon. May not be right now. The child is weaned. And so here, David talks about his experience being like that of a weaned child. We might ask the question, at what age is a child weaned? Or we ask the question, at what age are we, as spiritual children, weaned? And the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves... We need to be weaned many, many, many times. Because often we fall back into this situation. Yes, God should be there when I want him. Yes, God doesn't exist only for us. And when he doesn't immediately respond to our request, that doesn't mean he doesn't love us. He doesn't care for us. And when there are personal trials, when there are dramatic events in the world and people ask, why are these things happening? Where is God? We have to say, I don't know, but I trust him. He's sovereign. I can have confidence in him. And of course, all these things are linked to our sanctification. And among the fruits of that sanctification, there is humility. And contentment. And again we might think of many many biblical characters. But let's think simply of the Apostle Paul. In Philippians 4. A chapter which almost a parallel in the New Testament. To this Psalm 131. There in verse 11 Paul says. I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances. I have learned That's one of my questions which I look forward one day if I'm able to ask Paul how long did it take to learn those things? What helped you to learn those things? Yes, God had to work on him to produce that contentment. One author describes Christian contentment in this way. It is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights 
in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Contentment is the biblical antidote to stress. Many, many biblical verses again emphasize the importance of contentment, trust. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great, is great gain, but if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Hebrews 13, 5, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 5, Young men, in the same way, be submissive to the elders. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may raise you up in time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. The progress. The progress. Then lastly, the exhortation. This little psalm ends with this exhortation addressed by David to all those around him. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And the word used there has the meaning both of confidence and of hope. David calls upon all of his people, the whole nation of Israel, to have hope and confidence in the Lord, to trust him. You see, the great, great danger for Israel was spiritual pride. They were the chosen people of God. They had great, great privileges, privileges that no other nation enjoyed. In this Psalm 131 was one of those psalms that the worshippers at Jerusalem would sing when they came up for some of the festivals. They were in the midst of this privilege. Here they were as God's people, able to sing his praises, meet in his house. And yet they often forgot that God wanted them to be a light to the other nations. Alas, Israel was not a light to the nations. And friends, exactly that same temptation lurks for us today. Who are we? Northern Irish prods? We're not like those other crowd. We think of those people all around the world, those Muslims, Hindu. We're not like them. We're colonanders. We're reformed Christians. We're not like those other people who have all these strange practices. Friends, If we have such attitudes, such language, we have forgotten that all of these privileges we have are simply because of God's grace to us, God's goodness to us. We have nothing in and of ourselves to boast. C.S. Lewis says somewhere, a proud man is always looking down at things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see something that is above you. We must keep our focus on Jesus. And in order to do so, we cannot be looking down on others. But 18 months ago, J.I. Packer died. And Packer was a brilliant, brilliant theologian. And many of us have been greatly blessed by his books. But someone who knew him well wrote this about Packer. In every encounter that I was privileged to have with him, I came away thinking of him not as a great man, but as a man who had personally encountered a great saviour. Each time I had the deep sense of longing not to be more like Packer, but to be more like Christ. Friends, that's the challenge to each one of us that we would be those who point to Christ and show the need of Christ. The psalm is a psalm of ascents, sung by the Israelites as they went up to Jerusalem, up to the temple to worship. 
And of course, they were only going there two or three times a year to some of the great feasts. But there, they had to offer a sacrifice for their personal sin. There was that constant reminder of their need of grace. Thankfully, we today, even with COVID, we're not limited to coming just a few times a year to worship. But every Lord's Day we can gather together. But each Lord's Day should be a fresh reminder of our sin, of our constant need of grace, a reminder of all of the privileges we have because of God's mercy, because of God's grace to us. But friends, if we ourselves personally have received grace, our longing and our desire should be that others around us would know that same grace. And so this is David's longing, O Israel, hope in the Lord. Is that our longing, our desire, O our neighbor, our friend, the people of our street, of our road we live on, that they would know that grace, that they too would have the same hope, What God has done for us, what the Lord Jesus has done for us, he can do for others. And I must be ready to serve, even in the most humble of ways, in order to commend Christ to those around me. You see, humility isn't a matter of being big or small, rich or poor, leader or follower well-known or anonymous, but it's seeking God's glory with all of our heart, regardless of what that means for us. When Christ takes all the place in my heart, there is humility, there is contentment, there is calm, there is peace, there is trust, there is prayer, there is service. And friends, we have to ask ourselves, is that true for you? Is that true for me? And we have to constantly ask ourselves that question. As I said at the beginning, quoting from Spurgeon, reading the psalm is easy. Learning it is much more difficult. May the Spirit who helped David, who winged David, also help each one of us here today to develop these qualities that are pleasing to God, pleasing to our Lord and Savior, so that we might be lights, examples, beacons for the Lord Jesus in the community in which he's placed us. Amen. Let us close our service then as we sing using the words of Psalm 138. Psalm 138. And we sing stanzas three to the end of this psalm. The tune being Holly, number 15. All kings of earth will thank you, Lord, when from your mouth they hear your words, and of the Lord's ways they will sing, for great's the glory of the Lord. Then in the fourth stanza, although the Lord is very high, he looks on those who lowly be, whereas the proud and haughty ones, them only from afar knows he. Although through trouble I may walk, by you my life preserved will be. Yes, trust, confidence, peace. The purpose that the Lord has planned for me, he'll surely perfect make. Contentment. Your love endures forever, Lord. Your own hands works. Do not forsake. So Psalm 138a. 
From stanza three to the end, the tune number 15, Holly. Let us praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. And yet we acknowledge because of our sinful nature, we often have difficulty putting into practice. Thank you for your church, the bride of Christ. Wash your church this day with your word. Draw her that you are your people's first desire, delight and joy and confidence in these times. Keep her from being ensnared by fear. Unite your people, strengthen her for hearty worship and enduring joy in suffering. And we ask, Lord, for Drumbog, that you would fill the congregation here with a deeper longing for you and for the things of eternity. For those who are weak in body or spirit, Lord, strengthen. For the young and the mature, enable them to bear the cross with endurance, to, to die to self daily to live out the reality of being united with Christ in his death and resurrection. Help them, Lord, to bring every part of their lives into submission and captivity to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we turn to your word, grant that your Holy Spirit would show us Jesus and change us for the good of your people, the growth of your kingdom, and the glory of your name. And we ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to turn with me again to that chapter that we read in Acts chapter 5. And you'll have noticed uh, in verse 41 that when the apostles left the presence of the council, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer.